happy. So uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to our Family Medicine and Residency Curriculum Resource uh, webinar uh, on supporting bedside teaching using the Family Medicine and Residency Curriculum Resource. Uh, I'm Tim Graham. Uh, I'm one of the editors at the Family Medicine RCR, and I'm joined today by uh, other members of our editors team, uh, uh, Carrie Brackett, Scott Quartz, Natasha Lautenschlager, Alethea Turner, and then we're also uh, assisted by uh, Emily Walters. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as far as disclosures, as I said, all of us uh, who are speaking today are members of the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource Editors Board. Next, next slide, please. Our objectives. Uh, so upon completion of this session, uh, we are hoping that you're going to be able to endorse the importance of teaching residents at the bedside in addition to the traditional conference room settings uh, or uh, chat rooms or Zoom rooms uh, as, as it is right now. Uh, discuss best practices in providing bedside education to the graduate medical uh, learners. And then also describe uh, how just-in-time teaching curricula could augment that education provided to our residents in a variety of settings. And we'll talk more about what just-in-time teaching is a little bit later in this presentation. I would like to also say during this presentation um, that uh, we do have a question and answer uh, function on Zoom. So feel free to put questions in during the time uh, that we're speaking. Um, and we will have a ample time at the end to be able to go through those questions. Uh, if you do use the chat function instead of questions and answers, if you could make sure that those questions are directed to uh, all of the panelists and all of the attendees, just so everybody can, everybody can see the questions. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna actually start with a poll, poll, so we're gonna be interactive right away. Um, so the first poll uh, is asking you, how do you approach teaching during rounds? And you've got a few options, and uh, Emily, if you'd launch the, launch the poll. So options include bedside rounding as a team on all patients, table rounding as a team on all patients, bedside rounding on select cases, one-on-one -on -one rounding, or if you have some other format of rounding, uh, we would love to hear about that as well. We'll just give it uh, about a minute to allow everybody time to, uh, time to answer. All right, so it looks like uh, the majority of the majority of our participants actually use bedside rounding as a team with all patients, with the uh, next runner up being bedside rounding in select uh, cases, which is about 23% versus a 54% with the, with the bedside rounding as a team, uh, table rounding at about 15%. Uh, and then 8% other. And, and if you would like to, and we can talk about that later uh, in the chat, enter what other is. Uh, I think there was one participant that actually did that. Uh, we would love to hear what that is as well. So great. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pass off to Carrie and she's gonna take us into the next section. Carrie, I believe you're on mute. Good morning. I was the first one to do it, wasn't I? Learners love to learn from their mentors, their attendings, the people that they look up to. In one study, only 48% of learners reported receiving enough bedside teaching to satisfy them. And in fact, in that same study, 100% of respondents thought that bedside teaching was the most effective way of learning clinical patient care. It provides opportunity to learn through role modeling. You can incorporate didactic topics to the patients directly under your care at the moment. And you can also give feedback in ways that are not as easily facilitated in other forums. Next slide, please. There are benefits to faculty as well as learners. With respect to faculty and attending physicians, um, bedside learning decreases reliance or encourages less reliance on testing and specialists because you're there, your hands are on the patient. It, it affords a forum to expand personal knowledge and skills. You know, the, the answer, I don't know, encourages run and find out to quote Rudyard Kipling. It allows us a chance to deconstruct our personal preferences and habits 
and reestablish new ones. We reflect, we improve our clinical skills, and because we are in the presence of the patient, it encourages mindfulness. Next slide, please. There are a million deterrents. You all know them. This is your life. There are the reasons why this is difficult. And, not but, and bedside teaching, um, it pulls us away from automated practice. It gets us out of ruts. It gets us out of uh, siloed thinking. It fosters lifelong learning because we have to look things up. If we are on display for our learners, we have to know, you have to know. It focuses on skills. It focuses on the process itself. That's the faculty learning part. It allows us to demonstrate for our learners things that cannot be said in words. So there are benefits as well as deterrence. And our point today is that the, the benefits supersede the many and very real deterrence. Next slide, please. Of course, patient benefits. Patients part, participate as part of the education process. There is nothing like hearing it from a patient under the guided tutelage of the, the attending or the mentor, nothing like it. It forces patient-centered care because when you're standing there looking the patient in the eyes, you can't do anything else. And to an extent, it does contribute to quality of care. The patient will catch inconsistencies that we never would. And they speak up, they can advocate for themselves. Next slide, please. And finally, there are cultural benefits. And by cultural, I mean the culture of giving care in this country. When you are at the bedside, you make the rules and you optimize the culture of your team. How do we interact with patients? What are your shared expect expectations and beliefs of your residents? What actually in your definition is best practice? And then they watch you and they learn from you in ways that they cannot learn if you're doing table rounds. So it's quite remarkable. And I will pass now to uh, Alethea to continue on. Thank you, Carrie. So um, we're gonna actually launch into another poll, if Emily, you can start that. This one is regarding um, what are the challenges that you face? What barriers do you experience when trying to incorporate teaching? So our options are time, frequent barrier, experience, organization, level of engagement, and then also content of teaching sessions. We'll give it a couple of seconds for everyone to respond. Just thinking about what are the challenges and barriers that you experience when engaging in bedside teaching. Good. So thank you for everyone who participated. So looks like 80% of the um, participants stated that time was the most significant barrier that they experienced. Others also commented on level of engagement and then content of the teaching sessions themselves. So it seems like for the most part experience and organization, um, at least for this group of uh, people who are joining us today, aren't necessarily some of the biggest barriers. Go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. So to build on that a little bit, you know, when we think about these barriers, a lot of different things come to mind. And sometimes it is the discomfort of undertaking this and the uh, feeling of not really having um, the experience to be able to do so. A lot of times we rely specifically on lab results, imaging results, what did the consult, um, the, what did the consult physician state? Um, and we oftentimes find ourselves diagnosing away from the bedside and more just at the table. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please. Some other barriers um, that we've all experienced or heard of are some psychological barriers as well. There's a perception sometimes that table rounds are more efficient. Some people are often concerned, including both faculty attending and um, residents, also students, that maybe patients are going to talk and monopolize the time. 
also uh, limits related to maybe the volume of patients, the number of people on the census, also the acuity of illness on the panel, and also being mindful of resident hours. Next slide, please. Additionally, there's patient-related challenges, like we mentioned, sometimes concerns of monopolizing time. Um, also, there can be a lack of really clear objectives. What is our point in this teaching process with not only the learners, but the patients themselves? Um, patients or faculty or the learners not really knowing what the expectation is, so making sure that there is clear expectation. And then also lack of active learner participation. That goes a little bit into that engagement um, part that we were talking about previously. And then there's also environmental difficulties that um, come to play as well. Next slide. So one of the keys to overcoming these barriers is faculty preparation. And truly, we found that advanced preparation is key. It really helps to improve the efficiency, but also the educational value of that learning experience day to day. Next slide. And with faculty preparation, you can help to determine what topics should be covered that day, that week, really determine what the objectives of the rounds are going to be for that day, which patients should be seen as a team versus which ones maybe should be seen first. And then also opportunity in advance when you're preparing to correlate some of these objectives with the RCR curriculum. Next slide. So a lot of times when faculty prepare, there's different um, levels of preparation, but one is to propose just a quick review of charts, review the consult notes, lab diagnostic results, and kind of um, we use the term lab spy. So really just a quick peek either the night before or the morning before rounds, taking a quick look at different things that we have the advantage oftentimes of experience and being able to synthesize a lot of information quickly. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that preparation has to be lengthy, but this can really help to create a time management schedule for the day and for rounds, identify um, possibly inaccurate data during presentations from the learners, um, also being able to point out, you know, hey, did you see what physical therapy said today or what another consult um, note stated? Um, also, opportunity to correct presentation. And then, as we mentioned before, the opportunity to really select and hone in on teaching topics and focus what the um, objectives from an educational standpoint can be for that session. Also, you can supervise the learner without um, then necessarily being aware that we're being helicopter parents. Next slide, please. So advanced preparation really can absolutely help break down those barriers and doesn't need to be too lengthy either. Next slide. And some of those barrier, barriers to be broken down, you know, really that can help to provide confidence for the attending physician, um, particularly maybe in those who um, are new to this um, precepting world. Also to help in circumstances where less common conditions arise. You know, the attending can have the advantage of having reviewed some of these things a little bit um, to point the conversations in the direction um, in a specific way. Also to help if the attending, again, is not really familiar with that topic, so they feel a little bit more comfortable. And ultimately, the purpose is to facilitate smoother rounds, both from an efficiency and an educational um, standpoint. Next slide. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Natasha. Thank you, Alethea. So I wanted to talk about some different structures that you can use at the bedside for teaching. And when I say bedside, it's not just inpatient. This is at the bedside in the ambulatory world as well. So there are several structures that are they're somewhat varied, but they have some very similar themes. The first one being that there's always an introduction where we're either establishing the clear goals and communicating those. And this is kind of part of preparation as well, except you're doing it live. For example, if you have a patient involved, which most of the time we do, there's usually a family member, sometimes there's a nurse, there's other players in the room that this introduction brings them to the bedside. And this is often overlooked and also the most important. It establishes that player, that, that patient also as a teacher and as a learner 
and as a participant. So it's it's a very important part and it sets the stage for comfort in this. Um, the next part is the clinical teaching. This is where as the faculty is looking at, are we doing an individual teaching for the resident who's presenting that patient? Are we doing it for the team? Are we involving the patient as well so that that patient can learn from what I'm teaching this resident for their own care? And we're trying to balance it to the needs of that brief moment, but also generalizations that that resident and that patient can use in their lives or for their next patient. Um, and then the closure, which involves the debriefing and the summarizing and the questions. And this is also very much ongoing. It's it's not always step one, introduction, step two, clinical teaching, step three, closure. These are interactive and happening at the same time. Next slide. So one part that you'll hear a lot about and that you're constantly doing because you're basically doing a debriefing or an assessment and plan on this learner and what is necessary for that teaching is providing feedback on your assessment for that learner, having that clinical discussion, and then having that integrated summary. And again, this can happen at multiple stages during that teaching session at the bedside. Um, it may happen at the end of a patient visit. It may happen right in front of that patient at the bedside where you're Im improving someone's physical exam. It may happen at the end of rounds where it may be a debriefing over the entire rounds, or it may be at the end of the week or that, that difficult call night. So there's so many different ways that you can incorporate this. Um, next step, or next slide, sorry. So some, and one of the most common frameworks that you may have heard about is the one minute preceptor. And there's several iterations of this, but all of the iterations have these five steps in common. The commitment to a diagnosis, the probing for supporting evidence and providing teaching points and clinical pearls, as well as positive reinforcement and then constructive criticism. So the first part, this, this commit to the diagnosis is probably one of the most difficult for all of us to do because residents, learners, and our patients are very good at interrupting and keeping and trying to get us to give them the answer. Whereas, why, what do you believe it is? Breathe awkward silence and see if there's a way we can get that learner to commit because then you can go forward. Once they commit to that diagnosis or what they really think is going on, asking them for how did they come to that? What made you think of this? What makes you think that this is heart failure instead of a PE? Oh, this is how. And during that evidence supporting, you can now find that teaching point or that clinical pearl and provide that positive reinforcement. I noticed you did a really good job removing the patient's gown when you were listening for their lung fields because a gown can interfere, make it sound like they have crackles when they do not. However, it's also very helpful to listen to both lung fields symmetrically. You can incorporate that. So that's positive reinforcement as well as constructive um, criticism. Next slide. My next, sorry, I'm so used to dragging and dictating. So another framework is using the SNAPS technique, and this is actually more learner-centered. And this is part of that advanced preparation that Alethea was talking about. It's not just us as teachers. We really want to incorporate our learners and have them be active participants in this. And this is their version of that one-minute clinical preceptor, where as a learner, I want you to summarize what you found teach them to summarize and then ask me, okay, well, I'm going to give my teacher a narrow commitment so then I can pull out of my teacher what I might need to learn. And I'm as I'm analyzing, I'm going to say these things out loud. And then I'm going to probe my teacher and my attending for how I could come to that conclusion in a different manner or how did they come to their conclusion. And it, between that plan and that selection section, the, this is where the learner is asking the preceptor about their thinking so they can help manage the patient and come up with a plan together. And then the selection is basically figuring out what pearl from a learner's perspective that can be the most helpful. And ideally in a team setting, the learner and the preceptor are working together to help decide on that pearl. And again, this can be done in 10 seconds. Um, it's, it's finding that safe, learning, teaching environment. And often the patient may also contribute to this. This is very important for preparing our learners for this, especially when we remember that our learners just came out of a year, fiscal, you know, year 2020, where they may not have touched a patient. They may have no idea what it is like to be taught at the bedside, whether that's ambulatory or inpatient. Next slide, please. 
So the next part of the bedside teaching that we all use is some kind of teaching pearl. And often these can be teaching scripts. These are your mini lectures that you, we say prepare in advance, but really they may be things that you've done many times, or it may be your favorite mini lecture that you remember from a, an attending or a teacher that made an impression on you. And you integrate these into the rounds. Um, when I see a patient like this, I find that this is helpful. Um, and it's more focusing on things that is very useful. What can that resident or that patient take with them into their lives that can, that can help them for the next patient or the next call, call time? Um, you can use this in teaching scripts for your patients. You already do this when you discuss code status, for example, and teaching the resident those scripts as well. One way to turn this on the resident learner is tell yourself now what you know now. What kind of teaching script would you have told yourself as an intern were you seeing this patient who has hypoxia? What would second year you tell first year you for the same patient on call? Next slide. And then the next section is of course, augmenting your teaching with feedback. You may have heard about the feedback sandwich, which no one really likes because everyone's looking for the negative feedback in the middle. So we kind of throw that one out and it's more of a ask, tell, ask. And this is more of a feedback dialogue. It's more where we're finding out from the learner what they think they did well or how they think they did. And then finding our, ob our observations and reinforcing and redirecting that. Um, because we may have very different things. We may want to teach someone on a certain part and realize that they're actually quite deficient in something else, what they're much more confused about, and that's where they got hung up. And we may completely miss that. So having this ask tail um, dialogue going back and forth can be really, really helpful. And then asking the learner what kind of strategies work for them for improvement and what they might want to do. And be really aware that something that works for one learner may be different. And be careful not to disparage their, their choices. For example, if a learner uses up to date and it finds it very helpful, we can look at other options, but it's very helpful to encourage that instead of going, oh, up to date, that's not, a, that's not a research article or things like that. So kind of keeping it in, in line with that. Another part is once you're done with bedside teaching is ask, tell, ask yourself, how did that teaching go? How could you have made that bedside teaching better? How could you have prepared more? What did you learn? What went well and what didn't? And take that to your next step. So next I'm going to hand it over to Tim and go from there. Great. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, so next we've got another poll question. Um, and as, as we said at the beginning, uh, we were going to talk about how uh, the family medicine residency curriculum resource could be integrated into your rounds and help to augment that. So first question we'd like to know, just to know who we have with us, uh, is does your program uh, currently subscribe to the family medicine residency curriculum resource? This has got only two options, is a yes or a no. So we'll give a couple of seconds on this one. This was probably not one that you have to think about. <laughs> and we're, we're uh, most, most of our participants actually are uh, RCR um, subscribers. So about 62% and we've got uh, about 38% that are not. So that's great. So this is, this is a perfect, uh, perfect mixed group. So wonderful. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna just do a quick, for those who are not RCR uh, subscribers already, I wanna do a quick uh, introduction of RCR uh, and kind of give you some background on what it is and, and where we came from. So the, the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource, uh, it's a collaborative effort uh, from two of our societies, a Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, uh, also known affectionately as STFM, and the Association for Family Medicine Residency Directors, AFMRD. Um, so these two uh, entities uh, decided together that uh, they wanted to sponsor uh, being able to develop a, uh, a resource for all residency programs uh, in family medicine to have evidence-based peer-reviewed uh, topics uh, readily available to uh, the faculty and uh, residents. So it's really, in the, the cool thing about it is it's really the result of the efforts of the greater community of family medicine educators. So with that, I mean that the authors in RCR are are educators from the community. So they, uh, anybody can, uh, can submit 
to uh, be an author for a topic that they feel passionate about within RCR and then have the opportunity to share that topic with educators across the, uh, across the nation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so it, what it does is it provides uh, residency programs, uh, an extensive library of peer reviewed evidence based teaching tools. So right now, as far as curricula go, we have uh, over 200 uh, curricula that are up and posted and, and ready to use uh, by, uh, by our subscribers. Um, and they really, one of the nice things about uh, the curricula is that they really require minimum preparation ahead of time. Uh, there, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the structure uh, moving on, but uh, particularly it, as we talked about time being one of the issues uh, with rounding and uh, bedside teaching, uh, being able to have some resources that are evidence-based and peer-reviewed and that can be utilized uh, at the bedside um, it will help with that time, uh, that time constraint. Uh, next slide, please. So in the, in the RCR curricula, one of our requirements is that the modules actually incorporate some type of active learning methods. So we uh, know as educators that uh, standard uh, didactic uh, non-participatory um, uh, methods are really not great for long-term retention. Uh, so what we try to do within RCR is have case-based learning, have opportunities for uh, the uh, residents uh, to read ahead of time uh, and to uh, develop a, a, some understanding and self-study initially. And then when they come into the sessions, be able to activate, kind of reactivate that learning uh, by uh, interacting with the material, interacting with questions, and seeing how they can lead toward, uh, toward mastery of the material. We also do some pre and post testing to kind of reinforce the key, uh, the key uh, concepts from each of the curricula as well. And really these active, active learning methods help us to kind of enhance the learning uh, process. And uh, our goal is to foster a long-term uh, retention of the, of the knowledge. Uh, next uh, slide. So we've got another poll question again. Um, so if you subscribe to Family Medicine RCR, how do you incorporate it into bedside teaching, uh, if at all? So we've got a few options here. So we've got utilize, that we utilize portions of the curricula during rounds. We usually utilize portions of the curricula after rounds. Uh, we utilize portions of the curricula before rounds, uh, other. And then uh, the last one is that we don't. We don't incorporate RCR into bed or the bedside rounds. So this is really kind of directed towards those of you who are subscribers. You have a, a couple of minutes uh, for for you to look over that. Well, not really a couple of minutes. We'll give you up to a minute <laughs> to, to look that over. All right, so the majority of individuals do not uh, incorporate RCR into bedside rounds. Uh, and we did have 21%, so 79% did not incorporate uh, RCR into bedside rounds. And then 21% uh, actually use the curricula after rounds or portions of the curricula after rounds. Okay, great, thank you. Move to the next slide, please. So RCR really is designed in a way that it can be uh, used as a component of the inpatient uh, service rotation and with rounding. So uh, many of the modules, uh, when you look through them, uh, actually can be divided into smaller sections. So you know, one of the things with time being an issue on rounds, being able to go through an entire you know, 45 minute uh, or hour long uh, curriculum may, it may be challenging. Uh, but you could take components or pieces of those uh, the, of those curricula using those shorter se segments, uh, which have shorter time requirements as well, and then try to fit that into um, the, the rounding schedule. So it could be uh, given 
immediately pre-rounds, it could be given post-rounds, uh, it could be given uh, briefly outside a, a, a patient room or in a conference room that's near the patient uh, near the patient room. So uh, we want to we want to be able to provide that information uh, in a way that it can be easily used and pulled out when you're doing uh, some of those things that were talked about earlier with that advanced preparation when Alethea was talking about uh, doing kind of that that chart review ahead of time and saying hey this is this we've got a great case of X Y or Z and uh, look on our CRC if we've got that take a few minutes to be able to prep for it and then be able to use part of that section in, in rounds. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, after rounds, you know, you can, you can uh, give some of this to either the senior resident, the attending physician can help facilitate those small group discussions. Uh, again, of the curricula are uh, have a case a, a cases uh, kind of embedded in them that could actually be pulled out uh, to be utilized as part of that rounding experience. Uh, next slide, please. And, it, and uh, like I said, it could be uh, approached in a couple of different ways. So I've got a, a sample schedule coming up on uh, next on the next slide. But this uh, really taking some targeted education is one way that you could uh, possibly do it. Uh, looking at the cases that you've seen during the week or in that pre-rounding uh, cases that you've identified that would help select topics. Another way that you could actually look at using RCR is to develop a curriculum where you know that during uh, inpatient the inpatient service, you want these set uh, these set topics to be covered. The common stuff you see, uh, whether it's it's pneumonia or heart failure or um, or, or whatever pancreatitis, uh, something that you're seeing on a regular basis, and you know every time that uh, the inpatient service is run, that you want to make sure that the residents actually get exposure to this during their their three years with us. Um, next slide, please. So here, here's an example of how you might look at that. Let's say you were doing it even once a week. Uh, you could look at ACS on a, mon uh, a Monday of one week, uh, respiratory failure the next week, pancreatitis the next week, uh, DVT and pulmonary embolus the next week. Uh, and uh, Wednesday, I kind of left blank because usually you've got a, uh, you've got a didactic somewhere in there, uh, which usually compromise uh, uh, part, of, part of the week. Um, but it, you could have even a hybrid of that with having some set curricula, uh, and then also being able to do some uh, kind of just-in-time teaching, if you will, uh, when you are encounter other topics that, uh, that you would like to uh, discuss further because you have them on service. Uh, next slide, please. And that's, that's what we're going to actually talk a little bit about now is just-in-time teaching. So this is actually a newer component of uh, the family medicine RCR toolkit. Um, we recognized as our RCR, as RCR uh, has been around for a little while that uh, exactly what we're talking about with needing to have shorter components that you can actually use in more time crunch situations, uh, it could be beneficial. So we have added options for creating uh, smaller case-based curricula that um, can be used you know, between patients or be used on the inpatient service or be used before clinic. Uh, and really to uh, provide chances to work through specific cases with very targeted pearls of learning. Um, and these are intended to really augment the full curricular session. So, uh, so e each of those uh, just-in-time uh, sessions actually are kind of tied to a larger uh, curriculum that is one of the key uh, topics within the Family Medicine Residency Curriculum Resource lineup. Uh, next slide, please. And the benefits of this, it allows for abbreviated teaching uh, in a variety of settings, like I talked about. Um, and really, it could be integrated anywhere. You could actually also do it at the skilled nursing facility or whatnot, if you, wherever you have time and a need for teaching. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, targeted length of these, we're talking about 15 minutes maybe. Uh, the slides are about five to 10 slides, uh, including the title slide and the references. Um, and uh, we have a very set format for how we want those, uh, those just-in-time teaching cases to look. And we're gonna go through some samples of that here soon. Uh, next slide. 
And uh, one of the things that I want to at least pitch today a bit as well is the fact that um, we are looking for people to do just-in-time teaching and create just-in-time teaching uh, sessions. Uh, these can be created at the same time that if you, if you champion a specific topic, you could do the whole topic and then also do a just-in-time teaching edition, or you could just create a just-in-time teaching curriculum to augment a topic that is maybe already selected by another author. Um, it goes through a peer review process, just like all of our, uh, all of our curricula do. Uh, so the proposals are reviewed by the topic editor uh, that is assigned to that area. And then that uh, the, eventually the author is notified by email once the review process is completed. And you may get feedback that, um, you know, there are a couple of things we would expect the, for you to tweak or that it looks like it's ready to go. Uh, but you'll get that feedback uh, to be able to uh, let you know when it's getting ready for publication. Uh, next slide. So now I'm actually going to turn this over to Scott and he's going to walk us through some demos of two of the just-in-time teaching sessions uh, that, that we have already incorporated into our, our library. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. So uh, we'll get uh, moving here to a couple of the curricula that uh, uh, Natasha and I have uh, created to give you a sense of, of what these things are, are typically looking like. Uh, so our first uh, uh, curriculum is one that Natasha had created for a, a, a serious or severe alcohol withdrawal uh, and how do we uh, work through that. So uh, these, as Tim mentioned, these are going to be case-based um, uh, presentations where uh, typically you'll run into scenarios that you see on the uh, inpatient service when you're going to be seeing patients on the floor and, and scenarios where uh, nursing staff might be calling uh, the learners to, to ask specific questions uh, and targeting with, with uh, the teaching points here. So uh, this starts out with a, a scenario that uh, a patient with uh, coming in who was admitted for uh, pneumonia uh, and was known um, prior history of alcohol withdrawal and then starting out asking the learner what would they like to know uh, with that particular uh, question, focusing on, um, you know, when, what are the CWA scores for this patient and, and uh, uh, what would you want to uh, ask the nursing staff uh, outside of, of the questions that they are asking you. So the next uh, slide just again con uh, continues with the case presentation. Um, you, so you see that the patient is uh, tachycardic and hypertensive. Uh, their last CWA was uh, very high, uh, and then uh, two hours prior, it was it was uh, lower, so they are certainly not improving. And you can see they've received large doses of Ativan uh, over the past couple of, of hours uh, as well. So <clears throat> the um, at this point, you can probe into your learner's uh, knowledge of of um, you know asking. Uh, clarification questions and what what is important to, to know about this scenario is like when was that at last CWA score? Uh, you know, was it uh, an hour and a half ago? Uh, was it 30 minutes ago? Was it five minutes ago? And, and how is that going to change your clinical decision making based upon uh, when when that score score was? Uh, pointing out the fact that the patient has received uh, a large amount of benzodiazepines, their scores are increasing and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the patient isn't improving as, as you would uh, expect and how that should set off alarm bells in your, in your head just like a lactate uh, level that's increasing in somebody that's septic. Uh, we wanna see our, our um, CWA scores decreasing in our alcohol withdrawal patients. Uh, and, and also the, the pearl of, of noting that uh, um, you know, your patients that are coming in who are, who are ill who are chronic alcoholics, uh, a lot of times they're gonna be decreasing their, some, their consumption of alcohol when they're acutely ill and uh, potentially uh, coming in earlier uh, or presenting earlier with severe withdrawal and or uh, delirium tremens uh, earlier on in the course. So next slide just uh, talks with the um, uh, criteria for, for some uh, uh, refractory or resistant uh, alcohol withdrawal. Uh, there's, there's really not a, a standard definition of that, but uh, clearly you can see the trend of uh, when CWA scores are increasing and large amounts of benzodiazepines are, are given, uh, that's when you really have to uh, uh, think about uh, some alternative uh, options there for um, uh, uh, treating these patients. 
so this next slide goes through a lot of those options. So phenobarbital, uh, uh, dexmedetomidine, uh, or, or propofol. Uh, you know, certainly in this patient with uh, increasing CEWA scores, uh, <clears throat> you're going to want to consider additional treatment for this person to get them stabilized. Uh, this provides those those options for the the learner, and and you can go through the different uh, contraindications there uh, based on that slide as well. So back to the case, uh, the patient gets a dose of phenobarbital. Um, they're currently on lisinopril. And uh, what would you want to do with that uh, morning dose and why? Uh, so clearly you can go back to the previous uh, uh, slide based on the fact that uh, phenobarbital is going to cause uh, uh, or lower blood pressure uh, when, when given at least initially. And, and uh, it would be important to hold off on their lisinopril for the time being, just to make sure that the patient is going to get hypotensive. Um, and then another kind of real world scenario, the nurses asks, uh, are we going to have uh, some geodon on board as a, a PRN order for tonight if in case this patient gets agitated? Uh, ask the learner, is that what, what are you going to respond to that? Um, and uh, based on what their response is, you can provide them uh, some certain teaching points there about uh, the inappropriate use of antipsychotics and alcohol withdrawal and, and the risks associated with that with uh, prolonging QT, especially in the fact that this patient's receiving uh, uh, levofloxacin uh, in addition to potentially lowering the seizure threshold and, and uh, uh, causing uh, additional hypotension there. So uh, last slide just summarizes the uh, benefits of, of using adjunctive ag agents in patients with uh, uh, severe alcohol withdrawal. Um, and then uh, the, the next slide summarizes the salient learning points from the case. Uh, so you can see I kind of made through all of those slides within a six minute time frame. Granted, you're going to have a little bit longer teaching uh, uh, with that when you're having your learners uh, go through that scenario and, and with questions, but uh, your goal there is to get, uh, get through the, that topic within a 10 or to 15 minute time frame. Um, so the next case uh, uh, is Fournier's gangrene uh, that we ran into. I, you can decide whether or not you want to actually start out on this slide, or if you're wanting the resident to come up with the diagnosis themselves, you can start out just with the case and presentation. And so uh, here's uh, uh, someone that comes in, that obviously has a lot of uh, comorbidities uh, with a three-day history of, of severe scrotal pain and swelling. Uh, you can point out the fact that they're, they're uh, hypotensive uh, and he appears ill and his mucous membranes are, are dry, so he's clinically dehydrated. Uh, there's a nice picture there showing what a uh, typical case of Fournier's gangrene uh, looks like, uh, making sure that they're, they notice the black eschar and the uh, crepitus on the examination. Um, and then moving on to the laboratory uh, evaluation uh, with leukocytosis, hyponatremia, uh, acute renal failure. Uh, at this point, it's normal serum lactate, but uh, you know, at this stage, you can um, question your learner, you know, what's, what's your working diagnosis with this? And, uh, uh, and, and again, depending on the type of learning that you have, if you have interns or if you have uh, upper level residents or a combination of both, this could be a good way to get both of them engaged in terms of, um, you know, asking the, the third year to, to help contribute to the, the discussion if you're asking the first year with the original, original question. Uh, this ties into uh, the, the treatment of sepsis uh, as well uh, in terms of, of trying to have them recognize uh, stable versus unstable patients and uh, how, how do we respond to those in, in real world uh, situations. So uh, more of a question answer type of format with this uh, just in time. Um, and then uh, going through each of these questions, asking uh, uh, and, and probing and, and actually getting a little bit more specific, uh, you know, in terms of isotonic fluid bolus, where this would be a good chance to be able to talk about uh, the benefits of lactated ringers as opposed to normal saline in these types of instances. And, and again, uh, relying on your third year resident uh, uh, potentially to help uh, uh, point out those salient points as well. Um, then assuming that you're getting in your uh, 30 cc's per kg within your first three hours uh, in, of presentation in someone with sepsis, uh, what are you going to do if they're still hypotensive after that? You're going to add some vasopressors and then again probing what vasopressor would you start with uh, and hopefully they'll come up with norepinephrine and, and if so then you pat them on the back and, and move on to the next slide. Um, but uh, in terms of, of you know other questions that you're going to typically ask during uh, these type to, to see how they're thinking and, and what they are uh, hoping to um, uh, learn from, from this case, you know, uh, 
at least uh, uh, bringing up the, the point that, that imaging is not necessary for the diagnosis um, and, and getting these patients treated promptly with uh, uh, surgical uh, treatment and antibiotics is, is your, your main goal uh, to, to improve their, their outcomes. Um, and then getting back even to some of the basic science uh, uh, portions of, of this, you know, is this typically a um, um, polymicrobial infection versus caused by a single agent uh, and then kind of getting their, their uh, commitment on that and then moving on to uh, knowing that it's polymicrobial, uh, having them pull out their, their devices, uh, looking up on their John Hopkins antibiotics guide or their Sanford guide, uh, what's going to be appropriate treatment in this, in this uh, uh, scenario, uh, and then giving them a couple of minutes to, to find that information and go through um, the, the choices that uh, they're going to come up with. Um, and then uh, even on top of that, uh, having them recall back into to pharmacology, you know, we're already covering for anaerobes and gram positive organisms uh, with our, our uh, vancomycin and our carbapenem or our beta-lactam and beta-lactase inhibitor. What's the point of adding clindamycin onto that? And, and you know, having them realize the, the mechanism of action of the antibiotic in terms of inhibiting protein synthesis and uh, trying to reduce exotoxin formation. Uh, as well as a, a little bit of a epidemiological question here that they can see this infection very rarely in women, but most commonly is going to occur in, in men. So again, uh, the summarization of your, of your key um, uh, learning and clinical pearls uh, there on your last slide, you made it through the curriculum within five minutes. Uh, again, that'll be a longer time frame whenever uh, you're, you're asking those questions amongst your, your learners. Uh, but uh, just a, a quick demonstration with those two curriculum to show that you can get uh, some very good learning points and topics uh, that can be further expounded upon in, within your discussion uh, uh, within a relatively short time frame. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Tim. Hey, thanks, Scott. The, so yeah, so as, as you could see uh, that those were, uh, robust curricula for a short uh, time period that you actually got to spend uh, kind of going through them or that you had uh, time to go through them. Um, and again, having that preparation ahead of time uh, helps from the time perspective uh, with being able to integrate those into your into your clinical rounds. So in conclusion, uh, you know, bedside teaching is still valuable. Uh, just like uh, Carrie shared at the beginning, uh, our, our learners want bedside teaching, and it's really a, an important uh, component of the education, both our medical students and our residents. Uh, and it provides more than just the content um, to, to our learners. And, you know, there is the role modeling, there's the refinement of exam skills, Skills, uh, communication. You get to actually do some assessment of how their communication is as well. So there, there's a there's a lot of side benefits to to taking it to the bedside. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you, there, as as uh, Alethea talked through, there were lots of barriers that and, and there in in um, doing the bedside teaching, but those barriers uh, are really outweighed by the benefits to. Um, actually everybody, to, to the resident, to the faculty themselves, to the, um, to the patient, uh, to the culture of the, of the service. Um, and really, part of our responsibility is preparing our faculty for this role in a way that they can actually help, uh, help be successful uh, at, at uh, achieving this at the bedside. Next uh, slide, please. So our hope with Family Medicine uh, Residency Curriculum Resource is to be able to help all, help uh, provide tools. Uh, we're, we're providing tools to be able to help our faculty. We know our faculty, our, our members are, are short on time, um, and to be able to uh, create uh, quality, peer-reviewed, evidence-based updated uh, curricula on a regular basis, especially on the fly, if you're, if you're trying to grab them to take them to rounds on a topic uh, is, uh, is hard. Uh, so our, we're trying to take a little bit of that out, uh, out of the little bit of that work out for you. Um, and RCR, like I said, right now, from a, from a larger curriculum perspective, we've got about 200 topics that cover the breadth of uh, what we need to cover for the three years uh, our family medicine residents spend with us. Uh, next slide. And then the just-in-time teaching sessions are, uh, as we hope we showed, are a convenient way to, to kind of help both the residents and the faculty out in still having time-efficient rounds. Uh, you know, time again, 
cited as the number one uh, barrier. Uh, but not sa sacrificing the education, not sacrificing the patient care, uh, which are both incredibly important. Uh, and these ses sessions, uh, as I as my, my pitch kind of went, are actually really easy ways to actually get some uh, scholarly activity credit for your portfolios as well, because these are peer reviewed um, and they're published. So uh, it, it's a great way to get some scholarly activity on your on your CD as well. Next slide. We open up to we open up to questions. So uh, we've got about ten minutes left for questions, um, and we'll check the question and answer box. And also, I think we've been answering some questions in the chat already. But I'd like to open it up to some questions if anybody from the, from the audience has questions that they would like to answer. Because I think Natasha has done a really good job of answering all the questions in the ch in the chat as they as they have come along. And at this point, feel free to enter it either into chat or into uh, into the question and answer session. So we got a question for the just in time materials. Uh, uh, it would be great to have a mobile friendly view to facilitate bedside. Uh, yeah, that, and, and honestly, being able to do it on a mobile device uh, uh, definitely would be would be uh, helpful. Uh, you know, with uh, with you know iPads or slightly larger um, screens, uh, it would be actually pr relatively easy to still be able to take it around uh, and look at it because uh, a lot of these can kind of be viewed in uh, as since they are in PowerPoints within uh, within. Um, the uh, RCR website, they can actually be even transitioned to uh, PDFs that you could that you could scroll through um, as, as well uh, to carry on the go. Yeah, like, like Natasha said, the mini uh, iPad mini. Yeah, it, they keep it clean. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for the reminder, Natasha. Um, any other any other questions that we have? Uh, somebody asked about a recording. Yeah, there will be a recording of this uh, presentation uh, for viewing later. So it, it is being recorded. Oh, and, and Emily just answered that. Everybody's ahead of me on this. <laughs> so yes, to, to, to rephrase what Emily said, it is being recorded. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Anything one thing our that, panelists would like to add? Oh, Natasha, that sounds yeah, great. I think, I think one thing too is we're, we're working on making sure that we add those, those teaching techniques to some of these just-in-time trainings, like, like that reflection or the, the summarizing of those pearls and, and trying to make those pearls useful for other patients. And you are not obligated to teach every single pearl on there. They, those are designed to where you can pick what's relevant for that teaching moment out of that slide or out of that presentation for your group. So it doesn't have to be all six pearls, pick one and make it work for you. And, uh, no, that's a, that's a very, very good point. And one other thing that, that, that I'd like to just point out quickly, uh, since we do have some non-RCR subscribers uh, on the conference as well, uh, which I, because I did not go into a, a lot of detail over RCR and the structure of it, um, in addition to, with the regular curricula, in addition to the slideshows, uh, et cetera, uh, there also are facilitator guides to help guide you through specifically how to run that session, what the author had in mind, uh, give additional uh, pieces of information that you can share uh, that aren't included in, in, in the set. Um, and uh, also it has the quizzes, the, the pre and post test. And, 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 you know, we allow our authors to have some, uh, some imagination with what they do with these. So some of, some of our authors will create uh, more uh, Jeopardy game like uh, sessions. Uh, some of them have videos. Uh, some of them uh, have additional like handouts and resources that can go with them. So uh, at a bare minimum, every single one of them has the facilitator guide the quiz and the and the session but that that's at a bare minimum uh, many of our authors have actually taken it to another level and added additional additional material and i think one thing too is like if we summarize kind of some of our teaching points from our discussion today is obviously there are barriers to this and when we 
advanced prepare for this, we can use some of these tools that we've talked about for that advanced preparation. And I think for me as a faculty, when I was a resident and then I became a faculty, my biggest eye-opening experience was that there's really no such thing as teaching on the fly. I thought these attendings just taught on the fly and I was so intimidated because I was like, I have no idea how they do this. And learning that everybody else as well does some of that advanced preparation. They peek at those charts. They have an idea what's happening before was, I wish somebody had told me that at the beginning of my faculty year versus the 12 months later when I, my, when I learned it the hard way. Um, so that was a, a teaching pearl for, for new faculty that as residents, they only see our performances. They don't necessarily realize that as teachers, what we go, what we go through and the work we do and the reflection and self-improvement we do to get to where we are. Oh, that's a, that's a great point, Natasha. And, and you know, and all, along the same vein, um, the these these just in time um, presentations or these just in time sessions can also be used with our our senior residents, et cetera, to help uh, them build their uh, teaching skills moving forward. So when they do uh, decide that they want to go the academic medicine route, or if they do, uh, that they already kind of have a leg up on being able to do that and, and can learn how to teach medical students and how to teach their junior residents as well. And these are also perfect teaching opportunities for your, for ourselves. Like I built the um, alcohol withdrawal one because I messed, messed that up. I, I initially reached for Haldol or for an antipsychotic and I realized I needed to learn more about that. So that was a, a good opportunity for me to explore that better for my own learning and then pass it on to other learners. Yeah, there's there's definitely education in the uh, curriculum creation process, uh, as as we are you know able to spend uh, a, a far greater amount of time than we would if we were creating it only for our own program amongst a whole bunch of other curricula that we need to create. Uh, being able to dedicate you know uh, some uh, you know a month or so to to creation of a module that's going to be shared widely uh, really does make you a master of that material. And so that's a nice side benefit uh, for, for authors as well. So any other questions or comments? All right, well, I, I think we are almost at time then. So uh, for all of us uh, on the editors group, I would like to thank everybody for their attendance. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to any of us at any point in time that we can be a, of help to you. Uh, if you are uh, trying to figure out how to exactly use RCR or over, over anything, honestly, any, any teaching tips that we can give, uh, we, we are uh, happily here to, to help in, in any way possible. And I'd like to also give uh, thanks to Emily Walters for helping make this go very smoothly today. Uh, uh, so uh, the, this was, uh, the, the, we're, we're grateful for having you on our team. So, all right. So thank you everybody. Uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.